I invite you to open your copy of God's Word this morning to Matthew chapter 7 as we continue our series through the Sermon on the Mount. And I have a question for you as we get started this morning. I'm curious, how many decisions do you think you've already made today? Any guesses? This is permission to participate. 1,500. 1,500. Mike's been awake for a while. It's probably a lot. I mean, the, the more you think about it, the more you realize we are constantly making decisions. I mean, it starts when your alarm goes off. You think, do I let it keep going? Do I turn it off? Do I hit the snooze? If you do hit the snooze four times, as the look I'm getting from my wife would suggest, <laughs> then you decide, do I get up now or do I stay in bed for a couple minutes? Once you get out of bed, what am I going to do first? Shower, get clothes, breakfast? If so, which shampoo are you going to use? What food are you going to eat? I mean, the, the decisions we make are endless. One study claims that we make 35,000 decisions every day. And I don't know, that may be stretching the definition of what a decision is, but Regardless of what your definition of a decision is, the, the reality is that we make lots of them. Some of them are very trivial, while others are extremely, extremely important. And there's a lot that falls somewhere in between. But there's no decision greater than how we decide to respond to Jesus. There's no greater decision that we can make than how we are going to respond to the person and work of Jesus Christ. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter, chapters 5 through 7, and we've talked about how the Sermon on the Mount is about kingdom living in the broken world. How King Jesus radically transforms us from the inside out. And if you've been along for the ride, you know now that we have heard a lot about this kingdom that God is establishing and will establish in the future. We've heard about what it's like, what the values are, what the standards are, what the citizens of this kingdom are should look like. And now finally, we are actually getting close to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus essentially says in the passage that we'll be starting this morning, he says, now it's time for you to respond. Now it's time for you to choose. What will it be? Do you want to be a part of this kingdom that I speak of or do you want to keep living for your own kingdom? At the end of the day, you cannot simply be neutral to the person, work, and teaching of Jesus Christ. Right? I think it was C.S. Lewis who famously said he is either a liar, because he made some bold claims, or he's a lunatic. He actually believes the claims, but they can't be true, so he's a lunatic. Or he actually is, in fact, Lord. You cannot simply be neutral. His teachings are not simply something that you can listen to and just simply intellectually mull over, but rather his teaching is something that demands a response. It demands a decision. It demands actions which will not only impact the course of your life, but ultimately will have eternal ramifications. And so in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 27, we have, well, today is just verses 13 through 14, but in verses 13 through 27, we have a lot of different choices, a lot of different illustrations that Jesus uses in order to help us decide how will we respond to the teachings of Christ. And he does it in pairs of two. 
He has two paths that we'll look at today in verses 13 through 14. He'll have two trees in verses 15 through 20, two claims in verses 21 to 23, and then two houses in verses 24 to 27. And you can even take it one step further because in our passage today, there's about two paths, there's two gates, there's two ways, there's two destinations. In the, within the passage about the two trees, there's two types of prophets There's two trees, there's two types of fruit that are produced, and there's two results of that fruit. And then with the two houses, there's two foundations, there's two storms, there's two conclusions to what happens to those houses. And so we have these different warnings and considerations that Christ gives to us as we come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. But all of that to just say that as we come to the to the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus asks his listener, what is your decision? Which path will you take? Which prophets will you listen to? Which fruit will you produce? Which claim will be yours? Which foundation are you going to choose to build on? There can be no fence sitting. Christianity is not a religion where you can be half in and half out. Kind of like this comic of the guy sitting on the fence. His neighbor says, when are you going to stop sitting on that fence? Well, I haven't decided yet. It's like Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, where the people of Israel couldn't decide, actually, if Jehovah was God or if Baal was God, And Elijah tells them, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Who will you serve? Let's pray before we dive into verses 13 and 14 this morning. God, thank you so much for your holy word. We need it in our lives. We need your word and your spirit to have their way with us because we are selfish we're prideful we want our own way it's hard for us to trust and so we need you we need the truth we need the life of the spirit we need you to invade us today and to give us clarity as we look at your word i pray that you would help us to receive your word with meekness we pray these things in your son's name amen Let me just read for you the two verses we're going to be looking at in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So we start off... In these two verses, we have this comparison of actually multiple different things, but I'm calling it two paths. And it starts off with two gates. The first gate is a wide gate. The second gate, well, actually, the first one is the narrow one. But nevertheless, we have a wide gate and we have a narrow gate. First, let's talk about the wide gate a little bit. The wide gate, as one author said, is ideologically open-minded. It's morally non-restrictive, and it's spiritually very inclusive. If I picked one word to describe the wide gate, it would be inclusion. Everybody's welcomed. The wide gate says there are many ways to salvation. There's many ways to enter into this kingdom of heaven that Jesus has been talking about. The wide gate says says that we'll all find our way somehow. You might hear people say, well, Buddha, Allah, a list of other gods, they're all the same. You might hear other people say, you don't even need to serve God. It's all man-made anyways. You might hear others say, there is a God. 
but we have to make our own religion and our own rules in order to get it right. We have to change what he's given us and kind of make it our own in order to make it make sense. All of these different mindsets or worldviews would be welcomed through this wide gate. If the wide gate is inclusive, then the narrow gate, by comparison, is very exclusive. The narrow gate is not for those who want the approval of the masses, but rather it is for the ones who want the approval of the master. I think we even got a little bit of an illustration of this in Matthew chapter 6 as Christ is actually confronting a lot of the religious people of the day. He says, you're giving to the poor, you're praying, you're fasting, you're doing all these things, but why are you doing it? You want the praise of men. You don't actually care about the needy, you don't actually care about talking to God, and you don't actually care about communing with him and seeking his will in your fasting. You actually are just in it for the applause of men. You want the applause of the masses rather than the approval of the master. As Christians, we don't say that the gate is narrow because we're already citizens and we want to keep the club small. We don't say that Christianity is by its nature offensive and exclusive because we love parading our superiority over others. We don't say the gate is narrow because we don't think others are worthy or capable of entering. We say it because we know that nobody, ourselves included, are capable of actually entering the narrow gates on our own. It's narrow because there's only one way. And that is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. He says in John 14, 6, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We echo the words of the apostles as they were preaching the gospel early on in the church in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, where they said, there is salvation in nobody else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The narrow path in a lot of ways, or the narrow gate in a lot of ways, is like the the path less trodden. If you're into biking or hiking, you, you know that there's often one kind of main trail that leads you along your way. But off of that main trail, there's a lot of less taken trails. And oftentimes, those trails are more difficult, they're more work, but a good majority of the time there's a reason people have taken those trails because there's views to be seen that wouldn't have been seen otherwise. There's tremendous experiences to experience that wouldn't have been experienced otherwise. And this perhaps gives us maybe a glimpse into the next comparison that is made, which is the comparison between the easy way and the hard way. So each of these gates then open unto paths that are either easy or hard. The path that is hard that comes through the narrow gate is hard for a couple reasons. First, it's hard because if you are walking on that path, you will face lots of opposition. Lots of opposition. Jesus was not shy about encouraging people to actually count the cost of following him. One author said, Christ continually emphasized the difficulty of following him. He says, salvation is by grace alone, but it's not easy. It calls for knowledge of truth, repentance, submission to Christ as Lord, and a willingness to obey his will and his word. Even if we go back in the Sermon on the Mount, we see that persecution is actually a blessed thing in the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Jesus said in John 15, 18, they hated me and they will hate you also. In Acts 14, verse 22, Paul says, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. He says that to a group of believers right after, literally days, maybe a week or less after he was almost stoned to death. It says Paul was strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith. So it's hard because we'll face lots of opposition. It's also hard because this path is not natural. The easy path is what our natural response would be. The hard path requires supernatural intervention. One path is following the flesh. The other path is submitted to the Spirit. It's the hard path because the hard path includes all the ethics and realities of the Sermon on the Mount. And if you haven't been with us for the last several months as we've worked our way through the Sermon on the Mount, I'd encourage you to go back and read through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And tell me, does that type of living sound easy to you? Is it easy to live out the Beatitudes? To be poor in spirit, to be humble, to be meek, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to be merciful, to be pure in heart, to be peacemakers, to face persecution. Is it hard or easy to be the salt and light of the world? Or wouldn't it just be a little bit easier to just kind of blend in with everything that's happening around you? Is it hard or easy to continually and consistently pursue kingdom standards of righteousness? Or to seek first the kingdom of God instead of your own? Is it easy or hard to trust when you can't see? or to not be judgmental, or to treat others how you want to be treated, to truly, genuinely love others. These are not easy things to do. I want want you to turn with me real quick to one illustration of this in Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 30, I think we see an illustration where we can almost combine the the wide gate and the narrow gate, the easy way and the hard way with this illustration that we have in verses 16 through 30. Listen as I read verses 16 through 24. Behold, a man came to him, speaking of Jesus, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do in order to enter eternal life? He said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones do I have to keep? So Jesus said, you shall not murder, commit adultery, shall not steal, shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, well, I've done all of these. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, notice the standard there, of entering into the kingdom of God, a standard of perfection. He says, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But in verse 22, the young man heard this and he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. So Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. And so we're we're reminded there of this perfect standard that we actually have to meet in order to enter into the kingdom of God. That's hard to live up to. Jesus said earlier in Matthew 5, verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But the good news for our hopelessness is found in verses 25 and 26. Look at the disciples' response. They probably echo what we're thinking. The disciples heard this in verse 25, and they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? 
Well, nobody on our own. None of us are perfect. Romans 3 reminds us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Jesus responds in verse 26 with the hope of the gospel, really. Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And then he tells us in verses 27 through 20 through, through 30, essentially, that you will never regret making the hard decisions now as you consider what lays ahead in eternity. Verse 27, Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then do we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. That's the very point of the gospel, is that we cannot do it ourselves. We cannot reach that standard. That's why we need the blood of Christ to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 Corinthians 4.17 says this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Romans 8.18 would remind us, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy to compare with the glory that will be revealed to us. I appreciated the words of a guy named Warren Wearsby. He says, it's possible for people to know the right language, to even believe intellectually the right doctrines, to obey the right rules and still not be saved. He says, here is a test. Did your profession of faith or has your profession of faith in Christ actually cost you anything? If not, we should perhaps question if it was a true profession. Many people who trust Jesus Christ, he says, never leave the broad road with its appetites and associations. They have an easy Christianity that makes no demands on them. Yet Jesus said the narrow way was hard. We cannot walk on two roads in two different directions at the same time. It requires total surrender, complete repentance, and 100% dependence upon Christ and Christ alone for the forgiveness of our sins. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we can have the righteousness of God. The righteousness that we need in order to enter into this kingdom that Christ is talking about is not a righteousness that we can attain. It's actually God's own righteousness imputed to us because of what Christ did for us on the cross. And so we have a wide gate and a narrow gate. We have an easy way and a hard way. And then we're told that option number one, the wide gate that leads to the easy way is going to be full of lots of people. You're going to have lots of company on that road. You're going to have lots of encouragement. You're going to have lots of people patting you on your back and say, you bet, buddy, just keep following your heart. It's not very good advice, by the way. Our hearts are deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know them? The narrow gate, the hard way, it says few will find it. There will be many more who go their own way rather than giving up their lives for Christ. I think there are many people who appreciate Christ but don't actually receive him and put their faith and trust in him. There are some, perhaps, who think, really, it's too costly to me. I can't give up my life. I can't give up the control that I think I have over my own life. And so, because of that, I'm going to continue through the wide gate, through the easy way. There are some 
who perhaps are clinging too tightly to their sin. They cannot believe that something else could be better. The reality is there's lots of excuses for us not accepting Christ, for not accepting that free gift of salvation that comes through what Christ has accomplished for us on the cross. But the reality is that, according to Romans 1, you are without excuse. You may have excuses, but you don't have a good one. Everyone hearing my voice today is sitting here with a Bible in your hands or on your phone, or if you're listening online after the fact, you probably have multiple copies of God's Word in your household. You have the glory of creation. You have the special revelation of God's Word and His Son, Jesus Christ. The choice is yours. Well, make the distinction that Of course, this is not to discount the work of the Spirit and the sovereignty of God and His predestination and calling and justifying and sanctifying and glorifying work that ultimately only God can accomplish. But the reality is, you're hearing His word right now. The Spirit is pursuing you right now through His holy word. So, what's your choice? I think so often we're too self-sufficient, self-righteous, and self-absorbed that we don't want to look beyond ourselves. It's hard for us to look beyond today into eternity. It's hard for us to look beyond our own kingdom to see the ever-present glories of the kingdom of God. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is destruction. That's the way through the wide gate. It's the easy way. It's the way that many people go because they think they've got it figured out, but their thoughts are not correlated with God's word. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. These paths are leading somewhere. If we just compare these so far, and if we were to give a out-of-context survey to everybody in this room, and uh, think about your neighbors or your co-workers. Uh, we give this survey to a lot of people. We say, hey, there's, there's one way where you can enter through a wide gate. It's, it's very inclusive. You'll be very welcome no matter what you believe. It's a pretty easy road. There's not very many bumps. There's not very many hurdles. There's not very many, much opposition, and there's going to be lots of people coming with you. You can either choose to go that way, or you can choose this other way. It's through a narrow gate. It's pretty exclusive. You have to meet a really high standard of entrance. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be tribulation. There's going to be persecution. It won't always be fun. And there's going to be far less people on this road. I mean, why would you choose option number two on the screen? No normal human being is going to purposely choose the seemingly lesser of the two options. But that's why this final distinction is so critical. Because it highlights the eternal significance of choosing the right path. There's also two destinations. One path leads to destruction, while the other path leads to life, and I would even say, Christ would even say, abundant life. Let me put it this way. Would you rather take a luxury stretched limo after the service today to go have lunch at McDonald's, or would you rather take a three-day bumpy car ride for a free month-long, all-inclusive vacation to the destination of your choice. 
What do you choose? The limo ride to lunch at McDonald's or a three-day bumpy car ride to a month-long all-inclusive vacation at the destination of your choice? Some of you have never been in a limo are really struggling with this one. <laughs> you don't realize yet that it's actually not that cool. The choice seems easy. I mean, give me the all-inclusive month-long vacation. How much more easy is that choice if it's an eternal decision? Now you have to stay at McDonald's for the rest of your life. Or now you have to, you get to stay at this all-inclusive resort. Almost everybody would choose a little bit of discomfort now in order to enjoy the benefits and rewards later. How much more when we consider our eternal destiny? There's a choice to be made. There's one path that on the outset looks pretty enticing. It looks wide open, it looks easy, it looks comfortable, but it leads to destruction. There's another choice through the narrow gate, through the hard way with fewer people, but still people to be sure. That's the beauty of the body of Christ and how we encourage or should be encouraging one another. That's the reality, is there's two choices, death or life. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so in this passage, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Christ's main application there's one command in these passages, and that is to enter by the narrow gate. How do you do that? Well, Jesus says in John 10, verses 9 and 10, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I come so that they may have life and have it abundantly. You enter the narrow gate through the cross of Jesus Christ. You repent of your sins, you believe in Jesus, and you receive that free gift of eternal life that he has secured on your behalf by taking your place and taking the punishment of your sins and in return giving you the righteousness of God. I think it's important to, to note that there is absolutely value in counting the cost of following Christ. We should take that decision very seriously. But as hard and difficult and narrow and lonely as that choice may feel at times, I want you to also know this morning there is, in fact, unmatched hope, joy, peace, fulfillment, and satisfaction to be had in the person of Jesus Christ. So I ask you this morning, have you entered through the narrow gate? Are you on the hard path with fewer people that leads to life? If not, make today the day. Enter by the narrow gate. If you have, if you have put your faith and trust in Christ alone for the salvation of your soul, I would encourage you, now that you are through the gate and on the way, don't start trusting in yourself now. Continue trusting in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Encourage others. We mentioned there's, there's far fewer on the narrow path than there are on the wide path. And so encourage one another. Be the body of Christ. Spur one another on to love and good works. Don't grow weary in well-doing, especially to those of the household of faith. Encourage one another. Come alongside one another. Pray with one another. Be the body of Christ. I didn't put it on my presentation, but the last 
note of application is to invite others to come and join you. Invite others. Tell them of the love of Christ. Tell them of this journey that although it's not always easy, it oftentimes is difficult, is 100% absolutely worth it because of the forgiveness and freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, what a joy it is to be in your house this morning. What a joy to worship you through fellowship with one another. Even through our, our presence, being together this morning is a form of worship. We worship through giving this morning. We worship through singing. We were delighted to hear about opportunities to worship you through how we may be spurred by the Spirit to get involved with adoption, with fostering, or even with preventative or encouraging measures to those who are on the front lines of those ministries. We worship you this morning through the hearing and receiving of your holy word. And so this morning, God, I don't know where each individual is at in their walk with you and their relationship with Christ and their understanding of who Jesus is and what they've done for, for each of us. But I pray that we would respond. Jesus here at the end of his Sermon on the Mount basically is telling us you cannot just be neutral to the message of Christ. You have to respond. And so if there might be one here this morning who doesn't know for sure that you are in God's kingdom, that you are one of God's beloved children, I pray that you would ask somebody today. Maybe, maybe you're too shy to ask. I'd encourage you to fill out one of our connection cards and just quietly slip it into the offering box in the lobby. We would be glad to connect with you at a later time this week to share that blessed message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, for those of us who have accepted that precious gift of salvation, I pray that you would help us to continue resting in you. Help us not, now that we have accepted that free gift, try to keep it by our own merits or our own self-righteousness, but to continue humbling ourselves before you. Help us to encourage those around us and help us to invite others to join along. God, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' most precious name.